Okay, well let's let's get the, uh, for the record, um, state your first and last name and then spell it. So Mil 100 years from now we know who we yeah. are. Milton Clorman, M-I-L-T-O-N, K-L-O-R-M-A-N. Birth date 5-27-31. And we're filming at the National Atomic Testing Museum and the date is September... Seventeen. Seventeen. Uh, Two thousand eighteen. Uh, I'm Michael Hall. I'm the executive director, um, and uh, oh, we also want to ask you your birth date, please. Five twenty-seven thirty-one. Okay, very good. All right. Well, we're going to talk about your experiences. You were involved in at least one of the they called them the Camp Desert Rock exercises at the Nevada test site, yes. and. Um, we were talking, you, your experience goes way back to the early days, I guess, 1951, you said. Right. You might kind of lead up to what brought you to the, the test well, site. I was drafted, I was 19 years old, in 1951, a month before my 20th birthday. I went to Fort Ord, took basic training, heavy weapons training, and figured we were going to Korea. But uh, they said they started a new MP battalion, and I was chosen, shipped me to Camp Roberts for training. And uh, at the end of that training, we uh, led the convoy of uh, Army vehicles to Las Vegas on the camp to Desert Rock. And I was driving the lead jeep. And as I said, for some reason, I remember I had this Lieutenant Aber was his name, sitting next to me. And as we drove up the highway, to uh, 75 miles north of Vegas. And he said to me, turn right in the middle of, I said, there's no road here. He said, that's it. And as I turned right, that became the main road into Desert Rock. And we drove in there and uh, that's where we pitched uh, squad tents and we provided for all the troops that we shuttled in and out from uh, McLaren Field, they fly them all in from all over the state, try to drive them out to Desert Rock in six by six trucks, put them through whatever training, and then take them back to ship them out again. And I was there for probably, I got there in the middle of 51, and I left there, um, I guess around the beginning or the middle of 52 shipped me back to Camp Roberts, uh, an MP battalion, and uh, I stayed there till my, uh, till my release in uh, 53. Okay. That was it. So you said you were at the test site on that exercise for approximately how well, many months? Approximately eight or nine months. Okay. That's as I recall. And we saw, while I was there, there were about seven, seven explosions. Okay. That uh, we, but one of them at the the last one, they took us out to seven miles from ground zero, set us down on the desert, just sitting there with all I had was a field jacket on. The Atomic Energy Commission they had a concrete bunker out there with a loudspeaker and telling us what was happening, and it was freezing cold early in the morning, and uh, we watched a plane came over, I think it was a B-29, I'm not sure, with a red tail, and they uh, dropped, dropped the bomb from there. And I remember thinking, I hope they don't miss, seven miles is not very far from 20,000 feet. And when that explodes, they met, they said, sit down and don't look at the explosion because it'll blind you, because we didn't have any protective glasses, anything. All I had was an Army field jacket on with a hood up because it was freezing. And we looked the other way, and when that blast went off, it warmed me to the core, flattened you everybody. feel the heat? Oh, warmed me to the core, flattened everybody out there. They had, I don't know how many, hundreds of thousands of men we had out there in the test. And uh, I don't know why, but we're over there we were. I guess they wanted to see how it was going to affect us. And uh, warmed me to the core, and you could hear the uh, the concussion rolling up and down the hills all the way into Vegas. And uh, that was it. And just, we turned around and watched, watched that mushroom go up. 
and it was the most spectacular thing you'll ever want to see. Very frightening and dangerous, but spectacular to see. And uh, it rose about 20,000 feet. You had this great big white cloud on top, and all the stem with all this debris from the ground, sort of brown, going up. And as they explained to us from the uh, bunker, that it formed a, an ice cap on top of that, on top of that mushroom as the heat was rising, and then it melted that cap. Uh, that's as I remember that. And uh, that was about it. Tell them what you felt. Oh yeah, I told them. It, it hit me right on the side. And uh, 10 years later, 1931, I had, uh, I thought I had a lump there, and then I had surgery. I had a tumor taken out of my neck. It gave me 70 stitches in my face. Took this tumor out. Fortunately, it was benign. And I thought, boy, I dodged a bullet. 10 years later, of that 41, I had a recurrence. First time, they took the tip of the parotid gland off. Second time, they took the whole face of the parotid gland off. But it also was benign. And I remember my doctor at the time, we were, we were quite friendly. He had a son about my age. And he said, you know, you're in this examining room. There was a woman in the next examining room. He said, she had to say, he took your tumor and her put it on the table. He couldn't tell the difference. He said, you'll be fine. She'll be dead in six months. Right. And here I was with a wife, three small children, and a mother to take care of. It was kind of an upsetting thing, but fortunately it uh, worked out all right. And here I am at 87 years old. That's, oh, that's remarkable. I, so that was how many years after the test that you noticed? The original test, was, I was there in 51. I had the tumor, first tumor taken out in 31. Well, no. I was 31. No, no. when it, you were 31. When I was 31. When you were 31. And the second one, when I was 41. Okay. And uh, that was it. I've never had a recurrence since. But it affected, uh, took out the salivary gland, so for years, Every time I did, I always perspired from here. Uh -huh. So I had to constantly have a handkerchief wiping my oh. face. It, uh, but other than that, uh, I had no ill effects. I've had a healthy life and uh, done everything. And uh, here it, I am. It, it's interesting what you said. Now, you said you were just sitting on the desert floor because I know some Correct. of the later tests, they dug trenches. Yeah, yeah. And that, they were down in trenches. No, we were. We were sitting right out on the floor. Okay. And uh, I don't know how many of us were there. Uh, couldn't have been too many. But uh, we had, uh, uh, at the MP battalion, we had security for the area and constantly around the forward area. But I only saw the one go off. Okay. Where they had us there. So, so you were working security or you were there to observe? We were working security. Okay. Were, were there any soldiers in that test that were just there to observe? Because a lot of the, the Camp Desert Rock, they brought soldiers in just to expose them to the experience. That was after. That was, that was after. after. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you were actually kind of... Um, Number one guinea pig. <laughs> yeah. And, and what did you... During that time, do you remember any Pacific duties or exercises? I mean, some of the troops after the blast, they would they would tell the troops, you know, you walk towards the mushroom cloud. No, so we did, we didn't do anything. Okay. Think we just sat there, and they got us back and went back to camp, and uh, resumed our duties. We had town patrol duty in Vegas, okay. and uh, we had a uh, a barracks at Dallas Air Force Base for the town. We go to okay. take town patrol for a week at a time, patrolling the city, and uh, that was it. It, it might be interesting because uh, we deal a lot with the history of Las Vegas here, not just with the nuclear testing because they go hand in hand. Now you said you were doing patrol duty in Vegas back then. Yes. What, what was Las Vegas like in 1951? Was what compared the size of it is now? <laughs> and they had Fremont Street. There was a. The, the Flamingo had just been built, and that was way out on the Strip. The Sahara was here, uh, the Desert Inn, the, the Desert Inn or the Rancho Vegas before it burned down. And uh, uh, downtown you had, uh, the Mint wasn't here, you had, or the Fremont, you had the Pioneer Club, and you had uh, the Golden Nugget, and the, 
the we used to the main street with Fremont, the Skid Row, so to speak, was, up, there was second and third, third Street or Third Avenue. The police station was on the other end of, uh, and I think there was a Shamrock Hotel on that side. I'm not sure that sound in my mind, but uh, we had a, uh, uh, a room at the police station where we would check in, leave our weapons, and then go out to Nellis, spend the night there, and uh, we would operate out of that. But uh, that was a rough part of town right there on 2nd mm -hmm. and 3rd Street. Mm -hmm. it, uh, interesting time. But the, the Hotel of the Cortez was there. That was a two-story hotel. That was the only thing. And the uh, Golden Nugget was a wood frame, small place. That was it. But Were people aware of the atomic testing going on? Uh, yeah, they knew civilians. that, but nobody seemed to pay much attention to it. And what we, after the test, we ran, we would fly troops into McCarran Field and load them all on the back of six by trucks. Everybody, you had to be a, a, a bird colonel or general officer to get a, a squad, uh, a, a car. Everybody else in the back of a bus, mm -hmm. not a bus, a truck. A truck. And trucked out, you know, went, went off, shot off a bomb, trucked them back out to the airport, and we got the next shipping in. And we did that. I think we ran about 250,000 men through there, they said. And, and those men were going out to observe the shots. Yeah, well, they were, yeah, I guess, they were there just to, I, I think they just wanted to see, I guess we were, you know, with the Cold War, they thought we were, might get into a, a war with uh, the Russians. So they wanted to see how it would affect the troops, I imagine. Right. And we, that was us. And uh, they were trying to acclimate as many troops as they could, I guess. To the experience. Yeah, they really did uh confide in me, but that was what I surmised was going on. Mm -hmm. But other than that, uh, uh, I can't think of much of anything else. If uh, any other questions? You, you had mentioned that Camp Mercury wasn't really built yet. No. Was, just, no. was there anything, was it just Camp Desert Rock, or were there any staging areas that became Mercury? Because that was, Mercury was very close yeah. to well, where... Yeah, well not that I know of. You know, we were, we would have desert rock is what we knew right. it as. There was no, there was no mercury at all, as I recall. Right. Never mentioned it. And uh, the only construction we saw was this uh, concrete bunker that the uh, Atomic Energy Commission had out at the site. Mm -hmm. And we were on the dry lake beds. Yeah, kind yeah. of. You go up over <clears throat> the hill. Yeah, I don't recall that. Yeah. But I know they got us out there, sat us, spread us out on this uh, flat, flat plane and uh, told us we were seven miles from ground zero. <clears throat> and then the plane came over and dropped the bomb. Well, I know the early shots, the Ranger shots, they, they flew B-50s out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, and dropped the atomic bomb. And they were basically B-29s, B-50s. Yeah, that's what the B-29, I think. Yeah. That's what I'd remember. Yeah. And they had their tail painted red. So you don't remember seeing any towers? They that came no. just a little bit later no, when they built I, the tower and they put the bomb on the tower. Any of that? Okay. Well, yeah. that's unique because you were there really early. Yeah. Well, that's it. The jeep tracks were the main road. That right. was it. Right. Well, yeah. there wasn't hardly any infrastructure. No. no. Natalie, can you think of any uh, any you questions? Seven, uh, seven detonations. Yes, I said, I said we have seven of them while I was well, there. Well, I think there were seven or eight in Ranger. Yeah, oh. I saw one. That was the one we were there. Okay. But you could hear every time they run off, you could hear it and uh, you feel the shock waves. Now there was a, a fellow that worked with one of the contractors, and he was out there in the real early days. His name was Al O'Donnell. You probably wouldn't have met him, but he claimed that um, during the Ranger shot, that one of the shots actually blew windows off or windows out downtown. Did you ever hear of that? Uh, I don't recall that. You know, we weren't in town at that time. We were out in the 75 miles away. What it did in town, I don't know. You know, I wasn't, uh, we were out at the base. Okay. Natalie, let me ask you, do you remember any sort of uh, protective clothing or special uniform or protection gear? Nothing whatsoever. 
Did you even have goggles? Was no, anybody I had a field, I was wearing a field jacket, freezing yeah. cold, yeah. and with a hood on, but no facial cover, no glasses, nothing. They never even told us what uh, we were you'd be used for. Mm -hmm. They just said, you go out there and sit down, and that was it. Did you see anybody with a Geiger counter? Or nothing. Anything? Nothing whatsoever. Mm -hmm. The only contact we had when I heard the loudspeaker, and I never even saw the bunker. They were farther back, I guess. Mm -hmm. But I, they had a loudspeaker hooked up telling us what was going on. You know, the plane was coming over and what to look for and to face the other way. Give us some, but they had never any mention of your vulnerability or your exposure of what you were doing or if you were volunteering or not. Mm -hmm. They volunteered for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I say, I was just 20 years old. And uh, so there aren't too many people. And they, the, the rumors we heard was when they shipped me back to uh, uh, Camp Roberts, you know, worked post arcade, I was yard sergeant there. They, uh, the rumor was that they wouldn't let us out of the country for 10 months. So you couldn't, they would, I was on book to go to Korea about a half of the time. They kept knocking me off orders. And the rumor was that uh, they, just in case you saw anything or picked up anything in the forward area. And I figured they wanted to see if I was going to light up at night is what they really wanted to see, what the effect was going to have on me. Mm -hmm. They weren't interested in my well-being, to tell you the truth. And uh, never heard anything from anybody. And uh, uh, from what I heard, the government never admitted that we were entitled to any uh, compensation or uh, special treatment or health care. Uh, just till recently, they finally admitted that we, we were exposed, from what I understand. All that is the room, I don't know. But the government never followed up with you in any Never way heard a me? word from anybody. Okay. I, I was... Uh, I volunteered for the draft. I was 19. I went in from 51 to 53. They put me in the inactive reserve for five years, and then they sent me my discharge papers. But uh, that was it. The only contact I ever had with them. And uh, that's about it. Did you ever meet or know any other soldiers that came out on the other exercises? Because no. they were actually soldiers were involved up through 57 I think. Yeah. No, I so. never met anybody uh, that I was even, even even my own bunch I was, uh, I went to work when I uh, got home and I never had too much time to socialize. Mm -hmm. and, what did uh, they do with other uh, future soldiers who were on the site? Did they follow up with them and have any future now, interaction? Not, not that I'm aware of, but they, they got more sophisticated in later days. I mean, the soldiers would come in big groups and they would go on maneuvers, they would dig trenches. Some of the soldiers were actually with one blast within two miles of the, the mushroom cloud. Yeah. And then they got out of the trench and they started marching towards the cloud. Yeah. So, wow. uh, and a lot of people, uh, former veterans, um, have since claimed uh, it, there is an office within the government that you can, yeah, I guess it's very complicated to do if you have to prove somehow yeah, sure. that you, your cancer came from that and, you know, how can anybody do that? Uh, so they don't make it easy, in other words. Well, uh, the only thing, let me, let me say, uh, I thought about it and here I am, I've had a healthy life and uh, uh, I'm not one for the government. I did what I thought. I'm sure that whoever was in charge, they did what they thought was the thing to do at the time, looking at the big picture. I was part of that picture. And I don't uh, regret or I don't hold anybody responsible. It's a tough decision to make to send people out there. But when you're talking about global war, mm -hmm. uh, it's a small sacrifice for me to make. And uh, I don't feel any grudge or any, uh, uh, that the government owes me anything. Mm -hmm. And certainly, they learned a lot through all yeah, those things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And if I did my part and I survived it, I could have gone to Korea and gotten killed. Right. So, so uh, do you think that may have actually 
kept you from going to Korea because you explained Absolutely. how we were keeping you in the country? Absolutely. For I'm for sure of that. So, I, all things said and done, I have no, uh, uh, no problem with what the government did. Mm -hmm. at, at the time, you do what's expedient, looking at the big picture. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, uh, me and guys like me were part of it. Experience where you were on orders to be shut down. Oh, yeah, I told about many times I was on orders and uh, that I packed up ready to go, headed for camp. Oh. And bang, they would knock me off, and I'd go right back uh, to where I was. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I hadn't heard that before. That's yeah. Mm -hmm. good. Yeah, that, because uh, <clears throat> I was well aware of that. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel well, you know, I'll do what I have to do. And uh, uh, I had no. Uh, Compulsion. Very interesting. Are there any other questions any of you folks have? I want to ask <laughs> family. Well, you got me. Yeah, we're talking to you. Uh, I guess you said you were interested a bit about what was going on uh, in Vegas when you were, you know, patrolling the town. Uh, you mentioned stuff about that a little bit. You know, uh, the casinos like to have you guys. Oh around. yeah. Yes, well, when we when we were uh, on town duty, all the big because hotels and casinos, they wanted us there all the time because, you know, you get a, a town full of 250,000 GIs to get to drinking and raising the hell. So they wanted the MPs around all the time. So they were always after us, you know, come on back, you know, have dinner, have a drink on the house. It, uh, it's pretty interesting because, you know, it, uh, I always tell this one story, uh, uh, we got a call, there was some, uh, we had the, the airborne, I think it was the 101st Airborne out there. And uh, they were in town, and they were, I think it was the Desert Inn, or yeah, Raising the Hell. So they called us, and we get out there, and as I'm going through the casino to get to this guy, there was the commanding officer of the Airborne, the city, they were full colonel. And I stopped, I says, Colonel, I says, we've got one of your lieutenants is in here and he's raising a lot of trouble. I says, now I feel a little, you know, I, we're going to have to pull him out of there. I'm letting you know. He said, thank you. I'll take care of it. So he went out over there and got this sort of stood him at attention. He said, you get back to the base and report to me at 0600 in the morning. Yes, sir. And that, that's the record, you know, as a PFC, you don't want to be tackling a, uh, uh, an officer when he's drunk. <laughs> so that, that was one of the uh, uh, incidents we had. There. That's interesting. But uh, we, uh, it was never too much, it wasn't too much of a problem because we shuttled them in and out of town so quickly that I don't think they got enough time to get into trouble. You know, and, uh, uh, but 2nd and 3rd Avenue, that or the street, whatever it is, that was where the rough part of town. That was the rough part. Huh? That was the rough part. You know, the bars, the hookers. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I would, we would walk in there one time, I told the kids that story, I had my partner and I, we walk in this bar and there's this lieutenant, probably 22 years old, you know, pretty drunk and a couple of hookers, and I said to him, you better get out of here, you know, you're in trouble. He, he said, ah, oh, I can take care of myself, I'm okay, okay? So we made our circle around the block and, and we got back there about a, 20, a half hour later, he's out on the street all disheveled. I got rolled. I got ready. Well, I told you so. And, uh, that was about the only real incident. That must have been pretty rough for a soldier to get. Yeah, well, yeah, it was a tough spot. And that's where they all wound up headed because it was, things were a little cheaper there. Mm -hmm. The women were there, you know. Mm -hmm. it was a wild spot. <laughs> Other than that. You talked about the, uh, you know, the jail in town, but. You guys, the stockade that you used to work, was that out in Nellis? Well, that, that wasn't the, no, that wasn't the stockade. At Nellis, we had, being that, you know, town patrol, you had to wear a dress uniform and all. So they had a, a barracks for us at Nellis, where if we were going to take, we'd go into town patrol for a week out of the group. So we'd go in, stay there for a week, and patrol, to go back and forth there. We had a, uh, a room at the police station where we kept our, you know, uh, sidearms and all that stuff, and then stay at Nellis and uh, shuttle back and forth. Uh, but the, uh, 
we didn't have a we didn't have any trouble with the locker. We didn't know we didn't really use the locker out there. Not I, that I, I remember you telling stories about with the one guy with the mattress and you had Oh that no, that that was at Camp Robbins. Okay. That was, that was, a, that was okay. a, when I was yard yard at the stockade at Robbins. We had uh, well, well I might ask you because Natalie wanted to add the question, what other assignments did you have in the military? Were you an MP all through your service? Well yeah, well it just out of basic training I took I took infantry training at Fort Ord. Basic training was six weeks, and then heavy weapons training, uh, you know, at Fort Ord. So we were preparing to go right to Korea. That was another eight weeks. Then from there, that's when they formed this MP battalion. And I got picked out and to send to Roberts for training. And we went to Camp Roberts and trained there, you know, for MP. That's, then from there, we went to Desert Rock. From Desert Rock, back to Roberts, they sent me to the post stockade as a MP there. We ran the stockade. I was assistant yard sergeant at the stockade. And, uh, and we had a lot of, we had a prison ward at the hospital because, you know, you had a lot of, uh, we had some pretty hairy incidents there with uh, prisoners. But uh, it was interesting, you know. Uh, other than that, but uh, minor, it was. Uh, okay. But I served out my time there, and I was discharged from there. Okay. That was it. I'm sort of curious about uh, the future guinea pigs <laughs> who are out there in your interviews and information. What were some of the big issues that came up in terms of those guys? Health issues? Health issues or policy issues or anything? Well, to be honest, I've only been out here three years, but I have never really met anybody in person that had a health issue. Met a lot of veterans um, that were, some veterans were in the Pacific test and uh, others, and, and some of these guys, these guys, of course, you know, they're in their 80s and 90s, and they're pretty healthy. Well, uh, we had an interesting um, program here about the bikini, or the people that were at the bikini test on the battleship Nevada. And uh, the question was asked to these folks, you know, well, why, why, how did you survive without any ill health effects? And the gentleman told me, well, there were two types of people. They were people who took souvenirs from the ship and people who didn't. And the people apparently who took souvenirs from the ship that had been irradiated by the test died very quickly or developed very pronounced health effects. So they effects. are here to talk to. Right. Now, it's interesting, and I, I haven't met anybody in person that had ill health effects at the test site, but some of those guys were stationed pretty darn close in a number of the blasts. They were in trenches, exposed very close, and then they even marched closer. Um, the only rumor we heard at the rumor was that was that cloud, radiated cloud, passed over St. George, Utah. Mm -hmm. The cancer rate went through the roof. That's an area that has had a lot of controversy yeah. because the winds went yeah. east yeah. into Utah, and Arizona. They also, the next thing, Heard was when uh, uh, John Wayne right. did a movie about Genghis Khan mm -hmm. out in the desert here, mm -hmm. and there's about 250 people on the show, and a large portion of them developed cancer, died at a very young age, mm -hmm. and he did too. Mm -hmm. That's what we heard. But, mm -hmm. you know, just from Are those Lord. things documented here? We deal a little bit about the fallout issues, but most of what our museum deals with is the the history, the military and the political history of the Cold War. And um, in fact, I've got kind of a good concluding question that Natalie gave me I want to ask you, but uh, before that, I mean, do you have anything else we want or anybody else that we want to get on tape? Um, I, I hope if you have time, after the interview, I'd like for you to all walk through the museum. We'll give you a complimentary. Uh, yeah, we did. We were here okay. last night. Anybody wants yeah. to do that again, yeah. you're more than welcome. Uh, thank you. Yeah, now we, we were just curious about others because Milton doesn't have any um, specific information or, you know, know any other people who were involved. And thought maybe, uh, you know, through you, we would find out some other things. Because there was also a movie made by. Uh, uh, what's his name? Sheen, um, Martin oh, Sheen. Sheen. Martin Sheen. Uh, which specifically uh, is about uh, exposure mm -hmm. by young military people <coughs> and expose 
you know, the whole danger, which was never mentioned, explained, you know, or, uh, you know, any information given right. to these guys. And, uh, but we don't know uh, what, um, uh, how much truth there is in the specifics of the movie, but a lot of the higher up and the officers were well aware of the dangers, and they mm -hmm. just didn't want to rub yeah. shoulders with any of those right. guys. Right. And like I said, yeah. whatever it was, I'm pretty I'm okay with it. I'm here. I've got all these children, grandchildren, great grandchildren. If guys like me hadn't been out there and whatever information we provided, they might be here. So I'm okay with it. Well, that's. I'm I think okay. everybody appreciates your your service. <clears throat> well, it honors a, that. Joe. And believe me, I appreciate it too. I appreciate the fact. Whatever it did, it kept me out of Korea. Well. But, and uh, as I said, I'm still here. I've got a great family. I've got four kids, four grandkids, going on six great grandchildren. I'm okay. Well, that's great. And I've I've done everything. In every place, I'm okay. Wonderful. Well, j just to conclude, then Natalie had a good question. Maybe there's very few people living today that actually have seen an atomic uh, <coughs> explosion. I mean, did that change your opinion of the atom bomb or what? Uh, I guess I'm someone that lived through the, the Cold War too. You know, uh, do you have any uh, reflections on on the atomic bomb and the, the tensions? We're almost kind of going into a new Cold War now. You know, things are getting uh, heavy again with with Russia. What what's your opinion, having been someone who actually lived to actually see an atomic explosion? Well, it was the most spectacular sight you've ever seen, and uh, if it wasn't so deadly, uh, it was beautiful. It was spectacular watching that happen. But would you think of the destruction and the and the untold consequences for the radiation? scary it uh why uh, you got to avoid uh a nuclear war that uh i don't know how the, the planet would survive you know if everybody started throwing those things around mm -hmm. but uh it is so deadly that it uh, uh the thought of turning that loose it just you can't even fathom what what would what would be left well, look at Hiroshima, well, yeah, yeah. Well, it made you realize, you know, how serious yeah, yeah, nuclear it, uh, war would actually be. Yeah, yeah. You. Uh, that's why we need a strong, a strong government, and you, you, you can't be. We've got to deal from a, a position of strength. I'm a firm believer in that. It. Uh, uh, I don't. Uh, I'm not a uh, political person. I was a Democrat, a Republican, I'm an independent. You know, I look at one issue at a time. But uh, one thing's for sure, whoever's in charge has got to be sure that this doesn't happen. You know, we've got to avoid it, because there'll be nothing left. Okay. Being there and seeing that, did it change your outlook? Uh, not not change, just the realization of what the possibilities were. You know, and, uh, uh, I remember a few years after that, people were building bomb shelters in that backyard. Mm -hmm. You know, and, uh, uh, I have to, well, you know, if it happens, it happens. I don't have control over it. All I can do is try to assist whatever, uh, whatever I can do. And that's about it, you know, and there's one little cog in this wheel. But, uh, we have to back uh, whatever whatever government is in charge. You've got to be firm, mm -hmm. and uh, because you know there's a lot of bad guys out there. Well, other countries have the bomb too. Yeah, yeah, that's right. right. That's right. And you think about you know, your future depends on some idiot pushing a button someplace. Mm -hmm. It is. Uh, it's too scary to comprehend. Scary. Yeah. And uh, and I think of you know their future, you know me, I'm already here. The next generation. Yeah. 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 Very good. Any other questions from anybody?
Get a while I'm here, get me while I'm here. A lot of good information. Yeah. Dad, what was the most valuable thing you learned the whole time you were standing on Fremont Street? You yeah. learned that you could do something standing up. What? Sleep. Oh. Huh. Yeah, yeah, that was my favorite story. Yeah, I, you I, could tell me. No, tell that me. wasn't Fremont Street. That was. Oh. Standing guard in the stockade, there's a guard tower, <laughs> freezing cold out there, and the prisoners are all inside these warm barracks, and you're standing out there you freezing with a shotgun in your hand. <laughs> but that's another story. We've got a lot of stories. Well, this is very valuable stories for our archives uh, with the atomic oh, testimony. that I can be of some assistance. The, the museum uh, thanks you. Yeah. We thank your family. Thank well, you. Thanks for being here. You know, it's nice to know that uh, there's some record of what happened. It, uh, because records seem to get distorted as they go down through uh, generations. Uh, it, uh, it, uh, but it was funny, you know, we, that first rail car track, jeep track, was uh, the road. And I always remember this lieutenant's name of all people. And that's been, what, 60, 70 years ago? <laughs> What was his name? Abram, Lieutenant Abram. Mm -hmm. Wonder if he's around. Yeah, I don't know. Never know. Yeah, but, uh, so maybe it was the very first. Yeah. Death, yeah. The very first. Well, you were definitely there in the very beginning yeah. because those early shots, you know. Um, uh, okay. And what what is the sign we want to add? What? Okay, well, we're going to, uh, uh, just to end the tape again, give your name and the day's date, and we'll conclude with that, okay. for the record. My name is Milton Florman. Uh, today's date is uh, 9, 17, 18. My birth date is 5, 27, 31. Very good. Conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thanks for everything. Our Thanks for being here, believe me. Yeah. I appreciate it.